Someone starts talking here. They're finished talking here. Where do you formulate your response? Do you get to here? You get all the way there? That's great. I'm not here sometimes. In fact, have you ever seen the movie Up, right? And you know that dog, squirrel. <laughs> That's what I'm like when I'm listening. I'm just off somewhere else. So what I have to do is I have to take notes. I really speak about how to have communication be the difference in your career. So that has everything to do with, as a leader, are you communicating in a way that your employees want to take action? If you're a service rep, are you communicating in a way that makes customers want to come back? If you present technical information, are you doing it in a way so that your audience knows what you're talking about? I want you to think about the most difficult person that you ever have to communicate with. And it could be somebody from your past, it can be somebody from the present, it could be somebody in this room because it doesn't matter. But I want you to think about that person that when you have to talk to them, you just get tense. Like the hair on the back of your neck goes up. So this could be anyone, but it can't be your significant other or your teenager. <laughs> now as you picture them, what I'd like you to do is to think about why are they so difficult? In my studies, I have found the reason that most people are difficult to communicate with is because they're different. And the reason we do that is because we don't analyze. We just find ourselves getting our back up or finding ourselves having some pushback about somebody. It's like, I hate talking to that person. But when we do a little deeper dive, what we're finding is that there's a clash between styles. Well, that's okay because then there's something you can do about it. If I know that I only perceive you as difficult because you have a different style than I do, then I can take action. And here's the trick, chameleon communication. If you want to influence somebody who is different, it's best to meet them where they are, to match their style. Now, I get pushback on this. People say, Lori, I don't want to be a phony, I like who I am, and I get that. But let me just ask you something. Do you talk to your friends at the bar the same way you talk to your grandmother? Probably not, <laughs> unless your grandma twerks. <laughs> get that out of your mental Rolodex. The fact is, we naturally minimize the differences when we want to. What I'm going to ask you to do is to do it on purpose. One of the things, and it's the hardest thing for me, so honestly, I teach it and I'm still working on it, is being a good listener. And if you get that part nailed, if you really listen to understand, if, you, if your goal is to make sure that you get what that other person is saying and you do that effectively, your communication skills improve 100%. But as I said, it's something I still work on. I still struggle with it because good listening isn't easy. I want you for a minute to think about what listening looks and sounds like. So I want you to picture a television set. And on the television set are two people and they're talking to each other. But the sound is turned off. So what does listening look like? Nodding, Nodding. absolutely, what else? Eye contact. Leaning forward. Maybe they're leaning in, absolutely. So listening has a look. Now I want you to imagine that you're listening to a radio and there are two people talking to each other. You can't see them, but you can hear them. How do you know somebody is listening? What does it sound like? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -uh. it, it might be acknowledgement. It might be rephrasing or paraphrasing. It might be asking questions. 
So if you think about it, listening has a look and a sound, and because of that, you can model that behavior. I use a model called LAIR. L-A-I-R, not liar, that's a different session. Uh, <laughs> but the L in LAIR is for listen. So Stephen Covey says you should listen with the intent to understand rather than the intent to reply. L-A-I-R, listen, acknowledge, inquire, and respond. It takes a little longer than regular listening. Most people listen, respond, listen, respond, and sometimes they're wrong because they didn't really listen to the person. But when you do this method, when you actually acknowledge and that person can confirm that what you heard is what they said, when you ask questions that get a little deeper into what they're saying, and then you respond, it takes a little longer. So I think of it as go slow to go fast. It's faster to listen and respond, listen and respond, but when you have the wrong response, you still have to go back and do it all again. But if you take the time and use this method, you'll become a better listener, you'll slow yourself down, and the results are amazing. You'll also want to listen with your ears, eyes, heart, and mind. With your ears, listen for somebody's key words. How do you know their key words? Well, they probably repeat it or they add emphasis. You want to listen with your eyes. But here's the problem. When I normally say that, people say, well, I'm listening for a body language. What does this mean if I stand like this? Defensive. I'm defensive, closed. closed off, disinterested. Cold. Maybe I'm cold. <laughs> Maybe I've got a bad shoulder. Maybe I've got a spill on. Oh, you've met me, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> I often stand like this because I have spills on my shirt. But the fact is, it can mean lots of different things. Here's how we can tell how somebody's really feeling. It's right here. If we look for facial expressions, facial expressions are culturally neutral. And you can tell if somebody's angry or happy or scared, all from right here. All my sessions are highly interactive. I believe it's really important to get participants involved. They learn better when they're part of it. My job as a conductor is to pull the information from them and add to it so that their knowledge increases. I also think that sessions have to be fun. I know that when people are laughing, they're learning. To me, customer service is simply communication. It's the ability to understand what your customer wants, and that uses good listening skills, and then being able to give it to them in the way they want it, making sure that they have it in an easy way, that it's nice and it's personable. Are you more demanding as a customer than you used to be? Probably, right? I mean, most people are. And when I think about from when I started out doing customer service training, it has changed remarkably since then. Let me just ask you, how many of you have Amazon Prime? So if hands, a lot of you. How much effort do you put into purchasing something? Nothing. Nothing, right? Just push of a button. So we're more demanding now because other businesses have shown how easy it is to work with them. But it's more than that. All of our customers now are journalists and broadcasters, and they have an audience waiting to hear from them. My brother is a nobody. I love saying that about him. <laughs> he had a bad meal at a restaurant. So he gets online, and he writes on TripAdvisor about this bad meal. OK. So when I say he's a nobody, actually he's an amazing man, very successful, but he's not a gourmet chef, and he's not a, a food writer, he's just a guy. So how many people do you think have read his review? 49,000 people have read the review of somebody who 
in that world as a nobody. It is really important that we provide the kind of experiences for our customers that they want to talk about. And the thing is, it doesn't cost us a lot of money. What it costs us is attention. It means that we want to do small acts of personal kindness to people, that we see them, that we understand them, that we recognize them, and we relate to them. The departments that are lacking good communication skills is everywhere. I, I wish I could say, this group does a great job, this group doesn't, but it's, it's so mixed in so many places. I, how we teach it might change, but the need is there. I, I can't think of a group of people that wouldn't benefit from being a better communicator. I can't think of a single person, from physicians to government employees to an auto mechanic. Your ability to communicate has everything to do with how successful you'll be in your life. So what's the best way to deal with an angry person? Is it good to say this, no, just calm down? <laughs> what happens when you do that? <laughs> right, they blow up. So that doesn't work. But what does work is to match them. Not match their emotion, but match their energy. Here's what it sounds like. John, John, I want to help you. I can't do it while you're yelling at me. See, I match his energy, but not the anger. But I did something else, which is I used his name. Names are very powerful. How many of you have Amazon Echo? Does anyone have Amazon Echo out there? So for those of you who don't, Amazon Echo is a tube, and it does your bidding. You can have Amazon Echo order your toilet paper. It can play music for you or give you a sports score. It works really well. Now, if I say, order me toilet paper, Amazon Echo does this. <laughs> Nothing. So what do I have to do to get Amazon Echo's attention? Alexa, and the minute I do that, blue lights go off and she starts paying attention. The same is true for your angry person. When you use their name, blue lights go off and they start paying attention to you. What I make sure all my audiences leave with, if nothing else, the importance of communication. I want them to use the tools and techniques, but the first step is to get its importance. It's everything to me and being able to do it in a way that has impact, it's great.